bet you've never had a theme song like that, nice. huh? Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, so, I mean, full disclosure, uh, David McDonald made me a, a a personal theme song. And and his are good, actually. His, it's, his, it's, his are top tier. So, so I, mean, I actually so for one of for one of our streams, I actually sent him this song and I said, You need to play this the next time I'm on your show. And he's like, Oh yeah. Done. So, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, if I gotta be second to anybody, I'm glad it's David McDonald over at Deep Drinks. Everybody go check out after this, not during this. Yeah. David McDonald on Deep, Deep Drinks. Uh Dr. Kip, how are you doing? Where is he? Oh, Where um, is he? I'm well. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Just hanging in there, vibing, you know? You know how it nice. goes. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you being here. I feel like I've seen you yeah. more this week than I've seen members of my own family, which is wild. Um, but for anybody who may be just joining us and they're unfamiliar, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? What are we here to talk about today? Sure. So my name is uh, Kip Davis. I'm a biblical scholar specializing in uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, early Judaism, uh, in early Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls in particular. I also run a YouTube channel where I do my very best to educate people about the Bible in creative, informative, and I think exciting ways. Uh, I also have a course, an online yes. course that, uh, that you can take at uh, MVP courses called Real Israelite Religions facts on the ground and propaganda in the Bible Interesting. and the lecture that I have uh, uh, that, that I'll be giving today is, is drawn from the course. It's not the same lecture though, because yeah. in addition to uh, the course, I'm actually working on putting together a book based on the course. So um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a bit of a test drive today. You're yeah. going to, you're going to, you're going to get a chapter of my book along with the, uh, uh, along with the, uh, the, the PowerPoints. Yeah. And then David will get the whole course and the whole book on his channel. So that's, that's how we work. <laughs> no, that's awesome. No, I'm stoked. No, no. no, good. Me too. So very cool. Yeah. Um, and then you had mentioned that you are going to do your presentation in three parts and that after each yes. part, you'll have kind of an open Q&A. So keep that in mind, folks. I'm going to be starring your questions and your comments so that I can compile them for Dr. Kip at these moments. But please don't hesitate to throw them in the chat whenever you got them because we'd love to see them. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. It's all you. All right. Are we ready to go here? Okay. I'm, I'm ready if you are. Okay, so is the uh, is is the uh, the title screen up? Yes. Okay. I don't see it on that one. Oh, why not? Oh, back. Oh, that's why. Does it do that? Oh, look at that! Wow, Yay! I learned something new about my <laughs> something else new about my yeah. son's computer. Wow, We've been learning Amazing. for people joining us backstage. We were learning a significant amount about how all of this works. So you're getting you're getting the the raw Technology. real version. Absolutely. All right. So um, thank you again, uh, Sydney, for the uh, invitation. I'm I'm excited to do this. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is a lecture drawn from my online course and expanded into uh, a book that I'm presently writing as well. So my purpose generally is to educate about the fascinating parts of the Bible. And this material I'll be uh, delivering today about Yahweh more specifically. I would call myself a counter apologist, but... I want to make it clear that I'm not an anti-theist. Right. And right. one of the things that I'm going to hopefully be doing today is to show how theology, um, properly done, properly thought through, can still be a useful uh, functional part of the lives, not just of religious people, but of all sorts of people. So part of what I want to do is to help illustrate this, uh, how to do Old Testament theology, for lack of a better term, um, as, as skeptics, as, as atheists even. So 
the title of the lecture is uh, so this is uh, it's it's drawn from part two of my course, uh, the gods, and the name of the lecture is just Yahweh. Um, it's broken into three parts. First, we're going to be reviewing the Song of Moses, which is a text in Deuteronomy chapter thirty-two. And you're going to learn to love it this time, Sydney. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never uh, doubt Deuteronomy uh, again. Uh, don't. Don't. It's, it's the backbone. Deuteronomy <laughs> is the backbone of the Bible. So we're, we're going to go into this, this very, very ancient piece of literature. The Song of Moses is one of the oldest parts of the entire Bible. Um, even older than than all the other portions of the book of Deuteronomy and most of the rest of the Torah. So uh, we're going to spend some time on that. In the second part, I'm going to discuss how Yahweh is very much like the uh, Canaanite god Baal, who was uh, a storm god. And in the, in the third part, we're going to get into some of the theology of this and specifically Yahweh's meaning for the later writers of the Hebrew Bible. And hopefully uh, I'll provide a new way of thinking for a lot of people about Yahweh uh, in, in the audience when they approach the text. So let's begin with uh, the Song of Moses. Can everybody see that? The slide switched? Yes. Looks yep. good. All right. Looks great. Okay. So the Song of Moses is widely regarded among scholars as one of the oldest individual texts of Israelite literature. It is preserved in Deuteronomy 32. Now there's a parenthetical comment that appears just before the song in Deuteronomy 31:30, setting it historically at the time of the Exodus in the Bronze Age. And it says, then Moses spoke in the ears of the whole congregation of Israel, the words of this song, all the way to the end. Now, as old as the song is believed to be, it was not ever spoken by Moses. And there's no word on why he chose not to sing it either. Maybe he just couldn't sing, right? I don't know. <laughs> so, no. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy itself is thought to have been written much later during the reign of uh, Josiah, who was the king in Jerusalem between 640 to 609 BCE. And we first learn about Deuteronomy from the programmatic national epic, appropriately known by scholars as the Deuteronomistic History. Most people know this work by another name because it appears it comprises the entirety of the biblical books Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings. And it is so called the Deuteronomistic history because of how closely uh, the historical program reflects the theology of the book of Deuteronomy. Moreover, the Deuteronomistic history lionizes Josiah, and the earliest form of this work probably ended with a very positive appraisal of his dramatic religious reforms. Mm. We're going to start with this story. It tells of good King Josiah's efforts to renovate the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem, presumably long neglected by his father Ammon and his grandfather, the detestable King Manasseh, who we're told committed more evil than what the Amorites did who were before him. That's 2 Kings 21 verse 10. So when Josiah asks for an audit of the temple holdings to fund this project, the high priest Hilkiah announces that he has found the book of the Torah in the house of Yahweh. This is in mm -hmm. 2 Kings 22, verse 8. The book is brought to the king and read to him by his own scribe, Shaphan. This is something that scribes did because they knew how to read. The contents of the book, though, are jarring. Upon hearing it, Josiah is extremely distraught. And he sends for a prophet to help him understand the implications of this ominous document. He says, go, make inquiries of Yahweh on my behalf, and also for the sake of the people of all Judah concerning the words that was found. How great must Yahweh's wrath be that is kindled against us, because our fathers did not hear about the words of this book to do what is written in it. 
Mm. 2 Kings 22, verse 13. So a woman, a prophet named Huldah, who's connected either to the temple or to the king's court, we're not sure. She is found in her home by the king's retinue, and she responds to Josiah's great alarm with this. She says, So says Yahweh, the God of Israel. Say to the man who sent you to me, so says Yahweh, I am about to bring a disaster on this place and its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Because they abandoned me and offered sacrifices to other gods, so I have been provoked to anger by the doings of their hands, and my fury has been kindled against this place. It will not be quenched. So, after hearing this grave proclamation of doom, Josiah responds <laughs> to a comprehensive and ruthless campaign to eliminate all forms of observance to the God and instead attempts to centralize all sacrifices and rituals to Yahweh alone and importantly, only in the Jerusalem temple. Now, this is a bold move because within this cultural climate in which the many gods were always there, always enmeshed in the outworkings of nature and life, it could not have been an easy proposition. And sure enough, even the naked propaganda in the Deuteronomistic history preserves an echo of the brutality that must have accompanied Josiah's draconian mandate. In 2 Kings 23, 20, we're told that he sacrificed all the priests of the Bamot or the high places who were there, he burned human bones upon Jeez. their shoulders. Yeah, it's serious stuff. And do you like, is this something that you think historically took place, or is this something that you think is more of a fable to teach us a lesson? Um, so scholars are divided mm. on that issue. We actually we don't have any kind of um third party historical evidence for the right. work of Josiah. We know we know uh he was the king in Jerusalem uh at this time. So he was uh, real. But he was a real he person. Was, Josiah was real. And I I continue to like to think uh that this happened just because it's a great story. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an and, epic. And honestly, it's it's if you if you read it enough times as I have in the Bible, and you think through exactly what's going on every time. This is a movie script. Um, yeah, I was watching. I was watching Dan McClellan uh, do a live stream earlier today, uh, a Q and A, and somebody had asked him, you know, what what Bible story would you want to see turned into a movie? And yeah. for for probably twenty years now, I've been like Josiah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I want... So, and of course, the text because this is propaganda. The text promotes this guy as the good guy but there's right. there's many aspects within what if the story is true if what happened actually happened he was a terrible person i mean right right a, a brutal man right uh, who who but but you know this is I, I there's a certain there's a special personality type i think and it, it's always been this way i think there's a special personality type required to be um, a ruler of any right, sort. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's, there's an element of this narcissism or this, uh, this megalomania uh, right. that's embedded deep within every person. And those who, who have lots of it, they usually end up in charge. And I don't think that's, I, I, I don't think that's the, you know, that's, that's been the way it is since, since the beginning of time. Absolutely. And I don't think Josiah is any different. Right. So, Interesting. So, um, unfortunately, that's all we're going to say about Josiah because we have to move in now to this text, into the book of Deuteronomy, and specifically into the Song of Moses. So, what do we know about this God, Yahweh, whose frothing jealousy demanded such singular devotion? This brings us back to the Song. It's an ancient hymn that some scholars believe was appended to the Torah in the house of Yahweh that was discovered by the high priest and that we now know of as the book of Deuteronomy and was the inspiration behind Josiah's disquieting religious policy. 
Other scholars, and I tend to put myself into this camp, have suggested that the song itself was originally this book, that it was the whole thing. That's not important for now. In either case, the Song of Moses tells us much about the God, Yahweh, at the heart of this watershed event in Israel's collective memory. And I'm going to now just read through my translation of uh, the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 in two parts. Give ears, sky, let me speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching fall like rain, my speech distill like dew, like gentle rain on new grass, and like showers on tender plants. For the name Yahweh I will call out. Ascribe greatness to our God. Hatsur is a Hebrew word meaning the rock. His work is perfect. Yes, all his ways are justice. A faithful God without deceit, righteous and upright is he. Working against him, does not their blemish belong to his sons? Twisted generation and perverse. Do you repay Yahweh with this? Foolish people, not wise. Is not he your father who created you? The one who made you and set you up for life? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of one generation after another. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. When Elion apportioned the nations and inheritance, when he divided the sons of Adam, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. So Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in the howling chaos, the desert. He encircled him. He cared for him. He gazed upon him like a tiny man in his eye, like an eagle that awakens its nest, gliding over its hatchlings, spreading its wings, catching him, carrying him on its pinions. Yahweh alone guided him. There was no one with him, God of a foreigner. He made him ride over the bamot, or the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field. He suckled him with honey from the cliff face and oil from the hard stone. Tzurd, there's that word again. Butter from cattle and milk from sheep, with the fat of lambs, rams, sons of Bashan, and goats, with the very finest wheat. Blood of grape, you will drink wine. But Yashuran, this is thought to be a pet name for Israel. Mm. Yeshurun grew fat and kick. You grew fat, thick, and engorged. <laughs> then he then he abandoned God who made him and scoffed at Seward, his salvation. They inflamed his jealousy with strangers. With abominations, they provoked his fury. They sacrificed to Shadim, no God. Gods whom they had never known. New ones who came but lately. Not those whom your fathers knew. Seward gave birth to you. You forgot. You forgot El, who was in labor with you. Yahweh saw and spurned them by the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, and now this is Yahweh speaking, let me hide my face from them. I will see how they fare to the end, for they are a perverse generation, sons, no loyalty among them. They alone have inflamed my jealousy with no God. They, they enraged me with their emptiness or their their vapors. So I, yes, I will make them jealous with no people, with a stupid nation. I will anger them. For fire is kindled in my nose, and it burns to the depths of Sheol. That's the underworld. It devours the earth and its produce, and it flares up against the foundations of the mountains, and I will heap disasters upon them. I will exhaust my arrows on them, empty of hunger and emaciated by Reshef, poisonous Ketev, and fang of beasts. I'll talk a little bit about what these things are as I as I yeah. break this down in a bit. I will unleash these forces against them with venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outside the sword shall be reeved, and inside terror. Young man and virgin alike, nursing child with the man of gray hairs. So that's just uh, verses 1 to 25. It's cheery, isn't it? It is, I was about to say, I, I can't tell if he's loving or suffering. Is he in awe or is he in pain? Maybe both. A little bit of it's, all. It's a bit, it's a bit bipolar. It honestly. is. It is. Now, um, one of the things about, about the song that is that is particularly great is uh so this is 
this is Hebrew high poetry. Uh, the original text itself is is quite exquisite, and it is very well written. Um, and because it's so old, there's lots and lots and lots of scholarly conjecture about what much of the meaning of individual words and phrases within this text even means. So, and for that reason, my translation is is going to differ a lot from various ones that you'll you'll see in your in your published english bibles i'll talk a little bit about some of the um uh those variances as we go on here but i think i think the message of the song is pretty clear even if we don't fully grasp all of the spectacular word pictures yahweh's anger burns against his people because they've inflamed his jealousy toward other gods the song is pregnant with divine imagery that is unsurprising in view of stories that we find elsewhere in the Bible, in particular stories about the family of the gods in places like Genesis 6 or in the opening chapters of the book of Job. But here in Deuteronomy 32, we have mention of a god, El Elyon, and Yahweh together. Mm -hmm. So first, you still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, sorry, you broke off for a second, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh no, what happened? Oh, no, 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 all I was right. just saying, that's interesting. Okay. It, so, and this is referenced, this other God is referenced in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, there's a what, there's a lot of, and we're going to talk about this throughout the lecture, that there's, there's, this, there's this interaction and there's this interplay between a variety of deities throughout the Hebrew Bible that tends to get flattened by the English translations. And the evangelicals. We'll, not even that. I think it's just just by just by long standing church tradition over thousands of years, and wow. and Jewish tradition too, yeah. right? Because these are we we have to understand these are texts that are very very ancient, but right. that were inherited by you know these these later groups who had different ideas about what the texts even meant or how to use them. Right. So, right. Absolutely. Like an ancient game of telephone, basically. I. I, I guess in a manner of speaking, Translation I'm, I, yeah, maybe? yeah, it's, it's, let's, let's go with that for now. Um, I have to think it through though. Uh, but you'll see the text here on the screen. First, you have Elyon dividing the nations and Yahweh is receiving his inheritance. That's in verse eight and nine. Then Yahweh elsewhere in the text is giving birth to his people and El is, is in the throes of labor. That's in ver verse 18. But in this second passage, Yahweh is called by another name, Sur, which means huh. rock. And it's by this name, it's repeated four or five times throughout the uh, Song of Moses. It's by this name that the speaker proclaims Yahweh's greatness. He says the rock at the very beginning. His work is perfect. All his ways are or justice, that's verse 4. Um, Sur is then pictured as a doting mother, nursing his precious people, Jacob, his mm. inheritance. It says in verse 13, he suckled him with honey from a cliff face, literally nursing him as if on his breast, but it's a cliff face. <laughs> and, and oil from hard stone. And it repeats the name again, Sur. I just like saying it. Sure. Yeah, well, I picture some guy who's just like the ultimate like Viking man, just like being nursed with <sighs> like rocks and honey and oil and stone <laughs> from a, a man's teat. Yeah, a man's teat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but these same indulgent people who were coddled by Yahweh or its sword, uh, they abandoned the old gods for strangers. It says they scoffed at Seward, his salvation. They they inflamed his jealousy with strangers. And then it's we read... inflamed jealousy a lot, I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's easy to and do. It's, it, it certainly is. Um, and this is a this is a prevalent aspect and, and a fairly interestingly unique aspect of Yahweh relative to other gods of the Canaanite region is is his his total insistence that he just can't share power with anyone so no no it's it's got to be me guys stop asking me <laughs> to share 
It's true, right? So uh, these same people were indulgent. It says, they scoffed at Seward, his salvation. He inflamed his jealousy with strangers. Among these were upstart rivals, abominations, and unknown gods. It says that they were new gods and no gods, uh, divine creatures called Shadim in verses 16 to 17. What the Shadim were is not entirely clear, uh, but it's most likely a loan word from an, an older language, Akkadian, where there it's used of both protective and malevolent spirits or low-level cosmic deities. As if this portrait of malice in the divine council was not clear enough, though, there is a textual corruption in verses 8 to 9, which makes it abundantly so obvious. Now, in the Masoretic text, the Masoretic text is the standard Hebrew version of the Old Testament from which all our Bibles are translated. And unsurprisingly, this appears in most of our modern English translations as well. In verses 8 to 9, we are told that El Yon apportioned the nations and he fixed their borders according to the number of the sons of Israel. This brings to mind for the ancient, the astute ancient Hebrew reader that 70 sons of Jacob. I was going to say, there's a lot of sons of Israel. There's a lot of right? sons of Israel. Yeah. So in Genesis 46, 26 to 27, uh, Jacob, otherwise known as Israel, uh, when he migrated to Egypt from Canaan to escape the famine is said to have had 70 sons, 70 descendants that went with him down there. And there they increased and swarmed and became a great and mighty nation. Uh, one so well read could also connect this number to a list of 70 nations. Mm -hmm. In Genesis chapter 10, the descendants of Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, who populated the whole world. However tidy this alignment appears, it does not reflect the original text of this ancient hymn, which also predated the tales of legend in Genesis and Exodus by centuries at least. So there's an older form of this song known from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, as well as in a Hebrew, uh, it's, it's also known in Hebrew in a fragment of a small manuscript from the Dead Sea Scrolls that you now see on your screen so that this really is cool that effect you just did that, that was neat okay. eh? like <laughs> that was that. Tight. Yeah. so this is this is a fragment of 4q deuteronomy j 4q 37 it was copied in or around uh 100 to 50 bce and it is significantly thought to have contained this text deuteronomy 5 11 to 11 21 then exodus 12 43 to 13 5 then the Song of Moses, in that order. And that's it within this uh, manuscript. I'd love to go into talking about why these this admixture of texts and 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 the function of individual manuscripts within antiquity is, is so interesting and important. But unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that. So um, all that remains of this manuscript are scraps. Uh, but we are fortunate to possess this fragment, which contains part of Deuteronomy 32.8. And it alternatively reads, When Elyon apportioned the nations an inheritance, when he divided the sons of Adam, he fixed the borders of the people, not according to the number of the sons of Israel, but according to the number of the sons of God. This is the same setting against the backdrop of texts like Psalm 82, where in the council of El, El is the king of the gods in Canaanite religion, wow. the gods are humiliated. It says, sons of Elion, all of you, Yahweh's shouting at them. The passage that continues makes better sense of this picture in which Elion is not affixing boundaries on the basis of the number of Jacob's sons but is rather dividing the nation between his own sons, their inheritance, the sons of El in the divine council. And this corresponds neatly with the well-attested tradition throughout the ancient Near East in which the sons of the gods numbered 70. How about that? 
a tablet from Ugarit mentions the 70 sons of Atharat. That's another name of Asherah, who was the consort or wife of El. The Hittite Songs of Ulakumis speaks of the 70 gods. So in the following verse, uh, it says that Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted her heritage. So Yahweh's inheritance that he receives from his father, El Elyon, is Jacob, his people, cherished and adored, a reflection of himself. Now this, I apologize if this is a dumb no, no. question, but was 70 sons as much back then as it is today? Or was it not unusual for people to have with their concubines and things like that to have that many offspring would people have read this and been like whoa that's a lot of kids no, or would they have thought I, that's, that's a, a lot i okay yeah uh i mean you would you would encounter something like this i think in a handful of royal households you would right have to i was thinking royalty or somebody yeah. of power it's still a ton <laughs> that's, that's still a lot of kids like there's, right. there's never been a time where I, that wasn't a lot of kids yeah yeah this is uh yeah uh, this is this is Warren Jeff's territory. So I, <laughs> I'm I'm moving on though. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is but so Jacob or Israel is Yahweh's inheritance, and he, they're his precious adored people. Uh, they're a reflection of himself. One of my favorite lines in the poem uh, is this one. You know, they're like a baby that Yahweh cradles in his arms. He gazes into his eyes of this precious little bundle and he sees his own face staring back at him like a like a tiny man in his eye. It's <laughs> it's very it's rather <laughs> precious. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so Yahweh's deep love for his people is intense. It says he plucked him out of the desert in verse 10. He protected him and he cared for him like a bird of prey, carrying him aloft over the heads of predators in verses 11 to 13. He gave him the best food, the best meat and wine in abundance, we read in verses 13 to 14. Yahweh is determined that his people know it was always him and him alone. It says there was no one with him, God of a foreigner, in verse 12. The pain of Jacob's betrayal cuts deep and Yahweh spits out at this point an affectionate hypochorism. This is a name of endearment, but covered in barbs. Yashuran, he says, you grew fat, thick and engorged in verse 15. His adoration rebuffed. Yahweh is incensed. I will heap disasters upon them. I will exhaust my arrows on them. Empty of hunger and emaciated of Resha, of poisonous Ketev, and fang of beasts. I will unleash against them the venom of things that crawl in the dust. That's verses 23 to 24. So at this point, you remember the prophet Huldah, who delivered the, the message of doom to King Josiah. Right. That I mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, this threat of devastation that occurs at this point in the song is condensed by her into an oracle from Yahweh that she delivered in response to King Josiah's anxious hand wringing. She says, All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read is going to be the punishment. I have been provoked to anger by the doings of your hands, and my anger has been kindled against this place. It will not be quenched. She says in her oracle. Now, two other creatures appear in this rehearsal of Yahweh's tantrum. How dare they snub me? Uh, <laughs> so we have here the feared divine consorts, Reshaf. Uh, we know pretty prominently, actually, from other Canaanite texts. This is a very ancient god of pestilence and death. And Ketev. Um, is a mysterious being who also wields plagues and poison for weapons. And usually, wow. Ketev in particular is associated with, with arrows. Wow. So, And these are Yahweh's instruments of retribution. They're like arrows in his quiver, according to this poem. Now, however, his, Yahweh's impassioned rage then takes another sudden turn. And it's directed at those who dared to seduce his beloved Yashuran. 
uh, as the Song of Moses continues. And I'm going to uh, skip a bit and then read okay. here from verse 34 to the end in verse 43. Is this not hidden in storage with me, sealed in my treasuries? This is still, uh, um, or, or is it? Yeah, this is still uh, Yahweh speaking. Um, sealed in my treasuries. Vengeance and retribution are mine. In due time, their foot will slip. For near is the day of their calamity. It races quickly to meet them. For Yahweh will judge his people, and he will be turned on account of his slaves when he, he sees that the power is gone and no one is left, slave or free. He will then say, where are his gods? And here's the response. Seward, the rock, they took refuge in him. And Yahweh is dissatisfied with that response. He says, those who ate the fat of his sacrifices, drank the wine of their libations, let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now I, I am he. There are no gods with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is no one who snatches from my hand. So I raise my hand skyward and I declare, as surely as I live forever, when I wet my flashing blade and my hand grips on to judgment. Vengeance shall I wreak on my adversaries and against those who hate me, I shall retaliate. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword devours flesh, blood of the slain and the captive, the head of the enemy leader. And that's the conclusion of Yahweh's speech. And the song then ends with this. Acclaim Sky, his people. Worship him all the gods. For the blood of his sons he shall avenge. Vengeance he will turn back on his enemies, and he will atone for his land and his people. So It's uh, such beautiful uh, terror. It's I such, know, right? <laughs> it's such poetic terror and like anger and destruction, but also it's written with such awe. Yes. Yes, it's uh, it, it's it's a really remarkable piece of literature, and I wanted to to dive into that to start just essentially to make this point that this God Yahweh, predominantly in his earliest expressions, is a god of war. He's wow. a god of blood, violence, and retribution. And uh, before we move on to the second part, if there are any questions, if, if you have... Yeah, I actually took, I starred some of the questions that All came right. in. So the first one is, uh, I'll pull it up on the screen for people to see. Is Jehovah a proper name for the God of Israel? I'm so happy that that question was asked. Um, and I'm not going to answer it now because that's, that's coming up. <laughs> oh, is it okay? Okay, so is that TBD. is that all right? I hope yeah. Winston, that's okay, and I'm yeah. I'm needing you to hang on with me because yeah. we'll we'll get into that. Hang out with us, Winston. We're getting there. <laughs> and then the next question is: Is this act by Josiah similar to that Egyptian pharaoh that tried to make Egypt monotheistic? Just Josiah was more mm. successful. You you know and i'm not even sure we can i you know the 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 degree to which josiah was successful is i think debated um and the reason i say that is because the prophet jeremiah um i did my phd work with uh, the book of jeremiah and with with uh uh texts and traditions about jeremiah in the dead sea scrolls jeremiah uh, started his ministry actually during the reign of Josiah and continued after Josiah died into the uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the, the Babylonian exile. Uh, one of Jeremiah's constant complaints is just how much uh, people are constantly going after worshiping other gods. Uh, chapter Chapter 44 of Jeremiah, uh, the entire thing is is basically a diatribe uh, that Jeremiah utters against the people for their commitment and their worship to this uh, this this deity called the Melachet Hashemayim, or the Queen of the Heavens, or the Queen of the Sky. Mm -hmm. uh, this is thought to be uh, Asherah, 
or maybe um, uh, Atharat, as I mentioned from from the uh, the, the Canaanite texts. Um, and within Jeremiah's um, complaints to the people, they respond to him and say, you know, when we worshipped the Malekat Hashemayim, the queen of the heavens, we had it great. You know, we never yeah. suffered. We had plenty to eat. Uh, things were good. Uh, why on earth should we abandon that to go and just commit ourselves exclusively to Yahweh? So uh, that to say, sorry, um, that to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how successful Josiah's uh, reforms were. Um, they might have been, you know, uh, at the end of a knife or at, at the end of a sword. Um, and then once he once he died, you know, there was just no reason to continue uh, worrying about what might happen to you if if you weren't worshiping Yahweh. Um, but yeah, I think I think it, the uh, um, oh, shoot, I should uh, I should know the Pharaoh's name. Um, it bugs me that I can't I can't pull it up right now. Uh, but the yes, there was a so there was a 12th century uh, BCE pharaoh who uh, made this this uh, this move um, away from the worship of the gods to focus on just uh, the one deity. Was He's often called Akhenaten. Yeah, Ak Akhenaten. That's Akhenaten. It. There you. it is. I knew I was going to mention that. Nice. So. Um, so yeah, it, scholars have, have often said that he was, he was the first monotheist. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, but I think that's, that's probably from, from a, a, a social, historical, cultural, economic perspective, he's probably a good analog, um, mm -hmm. for, for seeing what, what this might've looked like. Uh, if this actually, if this actually is something uh, that did occur under uh, Josiah, we have so much more information about uh, Akhenaten and um, and what happened before and and after him. But that's and a great question. That is. And then the same person asked, any connection between this rock name title for Yahweh and a standing stone stele representation of Yahweh? Did I say stele? Uh, yeah, you did. Uh, so that is that is also, um, I think, a good question, and it's tempting to see that. But um, I I would actually suggest rather, and we'll we'll get into this a little bit more as I I continue to unpack this. I think this has more to do with Yahweh's association with the very. Uh, rocky, mountainous desert region uh, to the south, which is really where where this uh, this worship of Yahweh stemmed from in the first place. But we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. these are great questions. And then um, this one says Ecclesiastes five eight for hey that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Doctor Kip Davis, what do you make of this verse? <laughs> For hey, that is higher. If that's if that's the King James, then I can barely I can barely understand it. Um, I I would on the spot. I I have to look it up. Uh, that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Um, yeah, I I I hesitate. I'm I'm I apologize, uh, pragmatic crystal. I. I I I hesitate to to get into that without actually sitting down and and reading uh, what's going on in the text there. Um, oh, for but, he, uh, sorry, she uh, corrected the spelling in the chat. So for he that is higher than oh, the highest for regardeth. he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Yeah, I again, I'd have to. I I mean, I I think what you're getting at is this potentially sounds. Like it's um it's it's reflecting a polytheistic sort of worldview, um and I would agree it certainly sounds like that, but I I I can't commit to that until I take a closer look. I'm afraid. Interesting. Great and questions, I, I everybody. Yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome question. I need to move on here though. Yep. Yeah. That was the last one. All right. Good. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about Yahweh, the God of war. As far as the Israelites were concerned, Yahweh had always been there. Is not he your father who created you, the one who made you and set you up for life, it says in verse 6 of the song. The song goes on to say that Yahweh found him in a desert land, in verse 10, and that he suckled him with honey from a cliff face and oil from the hard stone. Now, the word translated as cliff face is Salah. And it is possibly a place name for a location in ancient Edom, which is thought perhaps to be the same place as, oh, that didn't go. There it is. As the magnificent Nabataean wow. Canyon city of Petra that survives to this day. Beautiful. Um, it is. It's, it's pretty incredible. I've always wanted to go. Um, not made it yet. Uh, so this region is in modern Jordan on the east side of the Dead Sea. It's barren and mountainous, and this recalls a well-established tradition of Israel's first encounter with Yahweh taking place in the desert to the south. It's a tradition that the 8th century BCE um, prophet Hosea also knows. He says, like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. That's from Hosea 9.10. The eventful first meeting was fictionalized into a story of Moses who experienced an epiphany of Yahweh in the jagged landscape beyond the Negev to the south. We read about this in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. It's most commonly cited as the starting point for answering the question of Yahweh's origin. So I'm going to read this text next, and I'm uh, reading my own translation of it, and you'll probably notice some, uh, some unusual things taking place here. Now Moses... Tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, drove the flock into the wilderness and came to the mountain of the gods, to Horeb. A messenger of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. He gazed and saw that the bush was aflame, yet the bush itself was not consumed. Moses said, I must turn aside to see this marvelous sight. Why isn't the bush burning? When Yahweh saw that he had turned to look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered, I am here. He said, do not come closer. Remove your shoes from your feet because the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid of looking at the gods. Then Yahweh said, I have clearly seen the misery of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cries for help because of his taskmasters. Yes, I know his sufferings. I have come down to snatch him out of the hand of Egypt and to bring him up from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. <laughs> uh, now, look. The cry of the sons of Israel has reached me, and I've seen the oppression with which Egypt is tormenting them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to the gods, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I could bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Here now, I will be with you. That is the sign for you, that it was I who sent you. And when you have successfully brought the people from Egypt, you together shall work for the gods or serve the gods on this mountain. Moses said to the gods, Say, I have come to the sons of Israel, and I say to them, God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What am I to say to them? And God said to Moses, Ehya asher ehya, which means I am being whom I will be. He continued, So you shall say to the sons of Israel, Ehya sent me to you. And God said further to Moses, Thus shall you speak to the sons of Israel, Yahweh is the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He has sent me to you. This is my name for all time. This is my invocation from one generation to the next. So this is a well-known passage 
and I expect you've already keyed in on some of the peculiarities in my translation of it. What's going on here? There are a number of key references to God in this story. Most prominently, he's identified by the Hebrew word Elohim, which just means God. But in several places in this story, the word appears also with the definite article, Ha Elohim. Do you know what a definite article is? No. Um, and <laughs> you get you get a grammar lesson today. So the definite oh. article... In, in, in English, language, yeah. yeah, in yeah. English, yes. So it, making a word definite is is a is a specifier, right? So it's it's the God, or in this case, right. throughout the Hebrew Bible, Ha Elohim uh, has the potential force to indicate a collective of deities. So where it occurs in this text, I've chosen to render it the gods. The same word occurs like this with the definite article five times in verses 1, 6, 11, 12, and 13, mm -hmm. and without it, Elohim, three times in verses 4, 14, and 15, in just this short episode. And then to complicate matters further, direct mention is made of Yahweh, three times in verses 4, 7, and 15, and another word, Ehya, is used to refer to him also three times, all in verse 14. And then the messenger of Yahweh is said to appear in verse 2 in what's becoming a very crowded flaming yeah. bush. Yes. Why do you think that is, that it they use so many different forms of the word? Do you think it was just an error, like a, just an editor's error? Do you think there was a deeper reason for that or multiple I don't know. layers of editing there, do you think? And I, and, and I think this is what I'm kind of teasing, trying to tease out in my own translation here is that I think at the heart of it, there's this sense that there, there are multiple uh, multiple characters involved, but that at some point, whoever put this story together in its, in its latest form has done his best to, to, to cobble them all together into the facade of one. Um, but it's, it's, it is one of those, it's one of those things, right? Like there's no, there's no clear indication why certain instances would be uh, would contain the definite article Ha Elohim versus just Elohim. And if you didn't know already, Elohim is a plural form of the word God. Throughout the Hebrew Bible, though, it's it's used constantly as just the designation of their God as a as a singular. Do um, they have? But, like a, a do they have something similar to Father, Son, Holy Spirit, kind of all encompassed in one? No, no, there's nothing like that. Got it. No, it's uh, yeah. Reading the Trinity back into the Old Testament is just a mistake. Yes, start. yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's very confusing. So, but I actually think that what's going on here uh, may be a feature. Uh, the ambiguity between how many gods, which gods, when are they speaking, might actually be intentional. Um, really? Yahweh is identified eventually as the god of your fathers. But the question Moses raises presupposes that Yahweh is not the only god, perhaps not even the only god in this blazing bush. Is this even Yahweh making this pronouncement, or is it another god, Elohim? When it says that Moses is afraid of seeing the gods, Ha Elohim in verse 6, or that he's speaking to the gods in verse 11, we should take the text on the face of it that at the very least, this is probably what Moses believes to be the case. If he is on the mountain of the gods, then why would he not have expected to be in the company of more than just one of them? So that's a great the question. point is that this it's a complicated text written, I think, in some respects to convolute a complicated origin story about Yahweh, who he was and where he came from. There's a I think there's part of it is preserving this element of mystique here, which right. is a good part of why this has been one of the most um written about thought about individual texts of scripture for thousands of years 
do you think it was done intentionally? Like we need to keep them confused so that they just don't ask too many questions? Or do you think it was just they they had so much awe and greatness for Yahweh that they just they just wrote from feeling and emotion without worrying about how much sense it necessarily made? So I think at the in the in the later periods, certainly I think it probably had more to do with the latter, mm-hmm. that they're they're trying to leave it as open ended as possible, um, an open question without answering the question. Um, okay. Yeah, it, and I think this is where like a lot of the mystique and the mystery comes in. If you don't understand something. Uh, clearly and perfectly, in some ways, it remains this transcendent other thing, right? Right. And I, exactly. I think that plays a part here. So, um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, we know very little about right. the backstory of the war god immortalized in the Song of Moses. But this one feature that he came from the desert wastelands of the south seems to echo an historical reality. Uh, numerous sources all promote an ancient southern sanctuary known by various names. Most commonly, it's called Sinai, but it's also called Edom in Judges 5.4, Paran in Deuteronomy 32 and Habakkuk 3.3, Taman in a variety of texts, and very interestingly, also in the 8th century BCE, Kintulit Ajlud inscriptions that were um, found Oh, what has it been now? I guess it's been about 50 years. But these are very interesting Hebrew inscriptions from the 8th century, uh, which are not biblical texts, but they certainly do contribute a great deal to our understanding of religion in the uh, period of these people. And then, of course, Chorav, as it's known in the story of Moses in Exodus 3. The great biblical and ancient Near Eastern scholar, uh, Mark S. Smith is keen to point out that this is a uniquely Israelite feature that is absent from all other Canaanite sources. This idea that Yahweh is a God that came from outside the land of Canaan. He came from the south. The earliest attestation of the word, uh, the word is Yahweh, and it's found in a list of places inscribed on the wall of a Nubian temple and dated to the reign of the 19th dynasty pharaoh Ramses II, who ruled between 1279 to 1212 BCE. Now, where it appears here, this is not the name of a god. Here, it's a toponym, which is a place name. It occurs in a listing of regions designated as the Bedouin area and featuring places like Seir in Edom, all within the southern deserts. It's believed that the name of this place, Yahweh, either attached itself to the local regional deity or vice versa. This association of Yahweh with the southern desert region in Edom is prevalent throughout the Hebrew Bible and stretching all the way back in time to the earliest texts, like in the Song of Devorah. This is widely regarded, maybe the oldest text in the Hebrew Bible in Judges chapter 5. Here it says, Yahweh, when you came out of Seir, when you marched out from the field of Edom, the earthquake, the sky dripped, even the clouds dripped water. The mountains crumbled before Yahweh of Sinai, before Yahweh, the God of Israel. So, one way or another, it seems that the earliest evidence is that Yahweh was a Midianite god, perhaps worshipped by a clan known as the Kenites. The origins of Yahweh with this group has found its way into the Hebrew Bible tradition by way of Moses, who is said to have lived for a time in Midian. In uh, Exodus 2.15, it says that Pharaoh sought to kill Moses, so he fled From before Pharaoh, he settled in the land of Midian. He settled by the well. In several places, Moses' father-in-law, who's known by various names, he's called Jethro or Ruel or Hobab, he's identified as a Kenite priest from the land of Midian. I've listed a, a handful of texts here on the screen where that occurs. 
Now, in keeping with the early descriptions of Yahweh in the Song of Devorah above and in the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, we see throughout the Hebrew Bible that Yahweh is a violent, warring storm god. He speaks in the thunder and hurls or shoots bolts of lightning like spears and arrows. Yahweh thundered in the sky. Elyon gave his voice. Hail and fiery coals, it says in Psalm 1814. Sun, moon, both stand aloft. Your arrows vanish in brightness. Your flashing spear in brilliance. Habakkuk 311. In Exodus 19, 16-19, Yahweh speaks in thunder from the summit of Mount Sinai to the Israelites, and the sound of his voice casts the earth in terror. A similar picture of this is uttered by the 8th century BCE prophet Amos. Yahweh roars from Zion. From Jerusalem he gives his voice. Pastures of the shepherds dry up. The summit of Carmel withers. In his most reliable earliest depictions in texts, Yahweh is closely comparable to the Canaanite storm god Baal. However, Yahweh, like Baal, is not just a storm god. He has also recently usurped control of the divine assembly, the council of the gods. Yahweh's distinction as a great warrior also rivals his dominance among the gods and probably stems already from an earlier period. So he's altogether very much a doppelganger of Baal, the conqueror, who also thunders from the sky. This is from the Baal cycle, tablet four, column seven. Baal opened a break in the clouds. Baal sounded his holy voice. Baal thundered from his lips. The earth, the earth's high places shook. It sounds very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Now, and there's more. As Baal rules from Mount Zaphon, this is far in the north, uh, so too does Yahweh rule from Zion, which is uh, the mountain on which the Jerusalem temple was built. Um, in Psalm 48, verses 1 to 2, it actually says that Mount Zion is Zaphon. So it's it's replacing, it's actually claiming this mountain that's way in the distant north that's Baal's mountain for Yahweh and basically relocating it to his temple in Jerusalem. He is a god of the mountains who, in the stories from Exodus, resides on Mount Horeb, as we read, or Mount Sinai. Fire is both a sign of Yahweh's presence and a weapon. The story of the Exodus features Yahweh's presence manifesting as both a column of cloud each day and a column of fire by night. You can read about that in Exodus 13, 21. In the story of Yahweh's contest with Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18, he defeats him with fire from the sky. The prophet Elijah there says, answer me, Yahweh, answer me. Then this people will know that you, Yahweh, are God. Then you will turn their hearts back. And the fire of Yahweh fell and it consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dirt. It even licked up the water in the trench. And the people saw and they fell on their faces and said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. So Yahweh also has control over the waters of the earth, the sea. Much like Baal's own mastery of the sea, Yahweh too has conquered the dangerous oceans to the west. By a blast of your nose, the water has piled up. Streams stood like a dam. Tahomot, or, or the depths, uh, congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will uh, plunder, spoil. My life will have its fill of it. I will unleash my sword. My hand will possess him. You blew your wind, the sea covered him. They sank like lead in the majestic waters. Who is like you among gods, Yahweh? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, by praises feared, doing wonders? That's Exodus 15, verse 8 to 11. Also another very, very uh, ancient text in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, in the book of Jonah, this is a story that everyone's familiar with. Yahweh famously manipulates the sea in order to catch his fleeing prophet. But maybe what you didn't notice is he's pictured throwing the wind like a javelin. It says Yahweh hurled a great wind at the sea. There was a tumultuous storm on the sea. 
in chapter 1, verse 4. It's a similar depiction of Yahweh's wind weapon as that which we see in the Exodus traditions. It says that Yahweh drove back the sea with a fierce east wind the whole night. He made the sea into dry land. The waters were cleaved in half by his mighty wind weapon. This is a scene that's repeated in the story of Israel's conquest of Canaan. When the people cross over from the eastern shore of the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, it says the waters flowing from above stood up, rising like a single heap. So Yahweh is also the God who controls the rain. The showdown between Yahweh and Baal, I mentioned in 1 Kings 18, happens as a result of a great drought in the northern kingdom. Uh, by the life of Yahweh, this is Elijah speaking again, God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, whom I serve, there will be no dew nor rain these two years except by the sound of my word. That's 1 Kings 17, 1. The second creation myth in Genesis 2 similarly sets Yahweh as the master of rain, growth, and fertility. On the day that God, uh, Yahweh God made the land and the sky, before every shrub on the field was on the earth, before every grain of the field would sprout, because Yahweh God had not sent rain upon the ground, there was no man to work the soil. So this connection between Yahweh's good favor and the presence of rain is a common one made of the gods, especially for those people who were totally reliant on the predictable seasonal cycles of growth and production. One of the features in the Baal cycle is Baal's submission to another god, the god Mot, literally death, who is otherwise called El's darling. Um, Mot kills Baal, or at least he thinks he does. I was going to say, I wouldn't think he could. Well, and there's debate about this because the, right. uh, the text is fragmentary, right? So uh, Mot says, I put him in my mouth like a lamb. He was crushed like a kid in my jaws. That's uh, tablet six, column two. But in the aftermath, El, the king of the gods, and Baal's father has a vision, which convinces him that Baal must actually be alive and lost somewhere in the underworld. But Baal's absence, either by death or disappearance, has resulted in a terrible drought. Sun, the furrows in the field have dried. The furrows of El's fields have dried. Baal has neglected the furrows of his plow land. Where is Baal the conqueror? Where is the prince, the lord of the earth? That's uh, tablet two, column four. One of the titles that Baal is consistently known by is rider on the clouds. And this too is applied to Yahweh directly in Psalm 104. However, within these lines, we see the same instruments of Yahweh's conquering power that were perceived in nature. We see his domination of the water, the wind, the fire, and the clouds. In the waters, he raises his high places, his chariot adorned with clouds, moving on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers uh, winds, his attendants flames of fire. And this brings us back finally to the formidable presence of Yahweh, the God of war, in the Song of Moses, in the last few verses of Deuteronomy 32. And I'll just read those again for you now. Okay. See now I, I am he, there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. There is no one who snatches from my hand. So I raise my hand skyward. So this is Yahweh declaring a vow. As surely as I live forever, when I wet my flashing blade and my hand grips onto judgment, vengeance shall I wreak on my adversaries. And against oh. those who hate me, I shall retaliate. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword devours flesh, blood of the slain and the captive, the head of the enemy leader. So who is Yahweh? He is Israel's warrior God. He is a storm god. He's the god of the mountain station on Horeb or Sinai or Zion or all of them. He's the god who brandishes fire and lightning and controls the waters of the earth, the sea, the rivers, the rain. Yahweh is Baal in every respect but name. And for the next part, we're going to get into the name of Yahweh, but I'll, I'll just take a break here 
if there are any questions so far. See, I've been telling people to throw them at us. Um, this is more of a comment, but I, th I thought it was interesting. They said maybe a good part of ancient Israel lived in Midian and moved to Canaan. So the uh, the thought is that um, whether it, so I, I need to say at the outset here too, um, as far as scholars can tell, uh, the Israelites um, were not particularly much different from the rest of the Canaanites. They were just a group of Canaanites. Um, so it, it, the way this works, it's thought that this, this god Yahweh came up from this southern region and first ended up in Samaria, which is actually more to the north. This is the capital of what came to be the northern kingdom, Israel, the more powerful, um, more populous, more wealthy um, kingdom uh, mm -hmm. compared to the kingdom of Judah to the south, which was much smaller, where Jerusalem is, um, where the ruling seat of the house of David was, was actually just, it was basically just a little garrison town, especially in comparison to to uh, this this kingdom in the north, which was much more uh, wealthy and powerful. But it, it, the, the idea is, is that that's, Yahweh ended up there first, and then probably after the Assyrian uh, conquest and of of Israel um, in the mid eighth the mid to late eighth century, uh, many of these people migrated south into Jerusalem. Jerusalem actually experienced a, a population explosion, and uh, they filled this this you know economic vacuum that was created by the disappearance of the Northern Kingdom. And it's thought that many of these traditions and maybe even the worship of God, of the God Yahweh himself actually came with them uh, then into the South. And that's where it, that's where it survived. Interesting. Fascinating. And then somebody cool, eh? posted here, they said, were mountains considered a means to come closer to Yahweh? I think um, you see this, Throughout the ancient world, um, this idea of within the Hebrew Bible, within the the Canaanite literature, there's mention of uh, these bamot, which are generally translated as high places or hills. Uh, these are thought generally, um, oftentimes they're just they're they're just general references to hills, but frequently they can they they, they indicate places of worship. You see also within uh, Mesopotamia, um, in in Babylon and in in Nineveh, the construction of these great ziggurats, these these stepped pyramids, which actually were um, temples or worship platforms. And part of the thinking there, I, I think it's it's in line with this idea that we go up uh, to get closer to the gods who are are up there. Um, I, when I teach this this course, I tend to say, uh, like the gods are the gods are part within this ancient mindset. The gods are part of this world. Um, they're not spiritual, like they're not these these ethereal, immaterial. They're very much real beings who live amongst us and are part of the cosmos. They're just very very far away. They're beyond. Uh, they're they're beyond reach physical reach which is why you can't see them um right. and the only way you can interact with them are, are through these special conduits which appear quite frequently on on mountaintops or hilltops or they'll build you know these huge um platforms uh as a means to to get closer and i think there's there's something to that yeah yeah absolutely and uh, it's interesting to me how much they could do back then without all of the technology it takes for us to get high up on mountains. I, I would be fascinated to find out how it was they did that other than just being raised in maybe high altitude areas. Um, yeah. And then this person asked, uh, what is the difference between Yahweh and Shadi? Shaddai? Or Shaddai, sorry. Uh, yes. I'm from so, Arkansas. Uh, and yes, it looks like Galax answered answered his own his or her own question that, yeah, these are these um, are best understood as different different deities who over time came to be combined. 
Um, so the most when it when it Genesis speaks of the patriarchs and in particular Abraham uh, worships El Shaddai, this ancient god, um, which probably was a distinct divine figure at some point who you know much later in time ended up getting amalgamated with Yahweh. Um, Yahweh just kind of swallows up. All these, all, all these other uh, rival deities and and their divine attributes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's it's quite interesting. This is also the most I've ever heard uh, spoken about, like a god and power and and um, revenge and might, and not heard a word about the devil, which is also very fascinating. When <laughs> well, you, there is. There's so much. So there's like so much without him, but I feel like American yeah. Christianity often focuses almost solely on devil versus God, devil versus God. When there's this entire yeah. narrative that has nothing whatsoever to do with Satan or the devil or sin. And it's just about the, the wrath of God, basically. So, uh, the, the stuff that we're talking about now uh, takes place and then was written down at a time before there ever was right. a devil. Right. Which is just uh, so interesting that one culture can base its entire existence basically around somebody that wasn't even being written about at this point. Yeah, I know, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, something I'll say one more thing, and then I'm going to move on here uh, okay. to the theology part. Um, so when I teach this course, uh, and when I teach about the gods, an important point to make is that Within the ancient Near Eastern mindset, within this this culture, these cultures out of which uh, the Bible came, uh, the gods were not, you know, good or evil. Right. Um, gods were like people. Uh, they yes. were just bigger and better, more in, powerful, or, and more powerful. Right. Uh, more consequential, but they they harbored all the same sorts of feelings, and they were subject to the same sorts of 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 weaknesses. I mean, here in this text, Yahweh is nothing but insanely jealous all right. the time. That's like the whole right? chapter. Is he's just very, very, and he's even saying yeah. it. He's like, "I am jealous, I and am, you are making I, me jealous." I, yes, exactly. like that self awareness is spot on. To be honest, there, <laughs> good for him. <laughs> Good for you, Yahweh. Uh, so, yeah, like thinking of it in these terms of God, gods are good and there's this, this malevolent force is the wrong way to think about it. The gods competed with each other. And you, ancient people would uh, provide service and worship to certain gods, either based on um, their regional like based on location, if if there's a, a, a patron deity or or a, a national deity like what Yahweh became for Israel, then you you worship that God. But there's there's you give you give service to certain gods depending on what you want from them. Right. And what you think they can provide for you. That's so a fascinating version. And to me honestly, yeah. I, I like this version better. Than the the American evangelical version. This one, this it's, one makes a lot more sense. It's like, yeah, I was gonna say he seems kind of jealous, and they're like, yeah, he is. He even says it multiple times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and not, and not righteously so. Like jealous, like like your your crazy your crazy ex boyfriend is jealous. Right. It's right. it's that kind of it's kind that kind of jealousy. It's that it's, kind of, where he even says like, you know, yeah, and you made me that way, so this is your yeah. <laughs> like yes. he literally says that. I think it's he does wonderfully say that. chaotic. <laughs> it's true. So uh, and that's I think you know that this is this is a good point now to to kind of jump into uh, the final part here, which is which is my theology of Yahweh, um, and I'll start with this. Uh, an important element uh, of the gods, something that I, I introduce when I when I teach this course, the the whole course, is that uh, gods the gods are are functional, um, and their entire persona is wrapped up in that function. So a god basically is what a god does, as we will come to Interesting. see. Interesting. 
Yeah. The, that phrasing so, is interesting. I enjoy that. Oh, good. I think I think I might have come up with that. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first. But uh, I'm going to start with the story, though. Uh, the third installment of the Indiana Jones film franchise premiered in the late spring of my grade 10 year before anyone watching was even born. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I and my friends went straight from school on opening night to do something that nobody does anymore either. We stood in line for hours to get the best seats to see Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So in the climax of this film, Indiana Jones must pass, to, pass a series of mortal trials in order to save the life of his father dying inside the threshold of an ancient medieval shrine in the Canyon of the Crescent Moon. This is located somewhere in the Kingdom of Haiti in modern Turkey. Having narrowly escaped uh, the first deadly test, he happened upon a jumble of Latin letters carved on stones on the floor and a clue, the word of God. Only in the footsteps of God will he proceed. Indiana perceives that he must successfully pass through the corridor by stepping only on the correct letters which spell out the name of God, Jehovah. He confidently puts his right foot forward and brings it down on the letter J, only to fall through the floor, catching <laughs> himself before plummeting to his death. A uh, rookie mistake. Idiot, he says. In Latin, Jehovah starts with an I. <laughs> so I'm I'm embarrassed. By the way, uh that scene in the temple in the canyon of the crescent moon was filmed in Petra. Uh, really? The yeah, the place that I, I mentioned earlier. It's I thought for sure it was gonna be like place. Arizona or something. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's no, what they always do. This is legit. This is totally legit. Uh so I'm I'm embarrassed to admit that uh it wasn't until my first year of university before I learned that this bit of pop culture was utter nonsense. Uh, God's name is not, and never was Jehovah, nor the ludicrous Yehovah, as Dr. Jones imagined. No, Winston is quaking in his boots, I bet. <laughs> he's, he's, you're ready Wait. for it, Winston? Yeah. This word was invented by German theologians in the 19th century by attempting to read a Hebrew word that was never meant to be read. So Hebrew is, that's supposed to go, there we go. Hebrew is a consonantal language. Uh, it's comprised of 22 letters, but with no actual vowels. Vowel sounds were from the beginning supplied by the speaker, but of course, this had the potential to sow confusion over time as Hebrew passed out of vernacular usage. Sometime after the 6th century CE in Europe, a group of, a group of Jewish scribes called the Masoretes invented a system of dots and dashes that they added beneath the letters in their Hebrew text in order to aid the pronunciation. And on your screen on the left, I have a fragment from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is a, a, a text from the Book of Psalms that was discovered at Nachal Hever. And you'll notice that uh, the letters are there cleanly written on the lines. And it's a little different from the text on the right, which was taken from the Aleppo Codex. Um, this is a ninth century copy of uh, the Hebrew Bible. You can see these little dots and these little dashes underneath the letters. So these are the vowel points that the Masoretes added, and which I never read because I'm always reading the, the older stuff from the, from the left. <laughs> so, so the Masoretes. Uh, now, this also presented a problem when it came to the name of God, Yahweh. Also by this time, it had become verboten to speak God's name. The medieval rabbis took the injunction quite literally. Thou wow. shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's Interesting. 27. Yeah. So the solution to this was to add vowel points to the consonantal name. And the name is formed by these four letters. Yod, He, Vav, He, reading from the right to the left. 
uh, which we theoretically and, and adding the the idea is to add vowel points to this consonantal name that will make its pronunciation difficult if not impossible thus reminding the reader when they encounter this word to say something else so vowel points from another hebrew word adonai which means the lord were added to the consonantal text of god's name and this is otherwise called the tetragrammaton. This was the result, which in Hebrew is not readily pronounceable. There's a bunch of um, uh, phonetical reasons, which I won't go into why you shouldn't try to, to, to pronounce this. But, you know, the Germans think they can do anything. So with some effort, <laughs> they figured that you could sound this as Yehovah. We can't say his name, but we can call him other stuff, and that doesn't <laughs> well, count. They're, they're Protestants; they can do what they want, right? So That's true. They're, they're not the rabbis. I'm sure the rabbis were mortified at, at uh, this when it happened. So the rabbis are like, dude. At this point, you might as well just say it. I don't understand what you're doing. You might like you <laughs> yeah, literally just right, might as well say yeah. it. <laughs> you might as well, exactly. So the rabbis' reticence to say the name Yahweh probably stems from a long-standing ancient tradition whereby the power of the gods could be harnessed by invoking their name. When Yahweh commands his people not to not take up the name of Yahweh your God unnecessarily, it is because the utterance of his name, like any god's name, has real power. The names of the gods were more than mere representations of them, they were embodiments. We are very clear about this from other Canaanite literature. The god Mot, literally the god Death, was the very substance Death. The god Yom, literally the god Sea, was the very substance Sea. The name Baal is the name, it's, it's the same word that means Lord or Master. In fact, the word is used regularly in the Hebrew Bible to mean husband. Baal functionally became hmm. the Lord. And this is just as El came to mean God. So these are expressions of who they who the gods are, but they're also expressions of what they do. So what of Yahweh? According to the story of Moses on the mountain of the gods in Exodus 3, the writer saw a connection between the divine name, the name uh, Yahweh, and this verb Haya, uh, which is a Hebrew word meaning to be. I've rendered the, I, I've translated this in the response to Moses's question about Yahweh's name as I am being who I will be. This is more commonly rendered, I am who I am. And then God goes on to say that Ehya, I am, has sent me. Yahweh has sent me to you. He says that in verses 14 to 15. However, especially without the benefit of accurate vowel pointing, there's no sure way of knowing what this word, the name of God, even is. Is it an active or a passive verb? Is it a present or future expression? Is it a participle? Is it even a verb in the first place? It's not altogether clear. So. Variations of the name, as we've mentioned, uh, appear on inscriptions from elsewhere in Egypt and Syria from as early as the 12th century. And these, but these unfortunately don't provide much usable context from which to determine the origin or the precise meaning of the name in antiquity. We already saw the earliest of these appearing as a toponym in an Egyptian 19th dynasty inscription. But this is not helpful for knowing more about who Yahweh is. Now, there's also attestation from the 8th century BCE of at least two Aramean princes whose names contain derivations of Yao. This is thought to be a form of the same name, Yahweh, and could relate to the connections made by the Bible elsewhere with the patriarchs, with the Arameans. For example, in Genesis 29 to 31, Jacob is said to have settled with his uncle Laban, who is the eponymous 
ancestor of the Aramians. In Deuteronomy 26, there appears to be something like an ancient creedal declaration in which the Israelite speaker identifies himself as the descendant of a wandering Aramean. Importantly, derivations of the name do not appear in cuneiform scripts or texts. Now, this is cuneiform was the common script of the whole Mediterranean region in the Iron Age. Now, what this means is that Yahweh was neither a Canaanite nor a Mesopotamian deity. Mm. Yahweh comes out of the southern deserts, the region of Seir in Edom. And in Exodus 3.1, Mount Horeb, also in the south, is identified as the mountain of the gods. When Moses encounters Yahweh there, he does not recognize him, even after he's been identified as the god of his ancestors. So in reading this passage, as we did earlier, we're prompted to wonder, is Yahweh's planned campaign against Canaan an indication of his own harbored territorial ambitions? One of the things that I, I tell students when I'm teaching this course is that gods are territorial, that they're like kings trying to maintain their heritage, their region, and also expand it. Yahweh, then, is more like an occupying power in Canaan than he is a native deity. And mm. I think his name actually reflects something of this. It's without a clear meaning for those who have adopted Yahweh to be their god. And thus, imaginations about who Yahweh is abound. And they abound for a long time. So... As far as the Israelites understood it, Exodus 3, in Exodus 3, 13 to 15, the name Yahweh was thought to have been derived from this tricky verb, meaning to be or to exist. Within modern parlance, it's become frequently synonymous with conceptual ideas about existence, um, as if Yahweh is the source of everything. However, an analysis of the name as a causative, meaning something like bringing into existence, falters on the grammatical point observed by James Barr long ago that the causative of this verb just does not occur anywhere. It's a completely anomalous form of the word in Hebrew, and likely this means that it's not even a Hebrew word to begin with. Some modern commentators are fond of seeing in the name an expression of timelessness and transcendence of reality. One says, this name for God points to his self-existence and eternality. However, this also seems unlikely against the backdrop of everything else that we know about ancient Near Eastern culture and religion. So this process of tracing the meaning of names in other words, back to their roots is called etymology. And this is basically what the writers of the Hebrew Bible were doing with the name Yahweh. Without knowing what the name Yahweh actually means, the meaning of the name is nevertheless presented in the passage in Exodus 3 as palpable. Later theological notions of God's existence and causation prompt this connection between the unknown meaning of the word and its similarities with the Hebrew verb, meaning the, the Hebrew verb Hayah. The name of a god was essential for knowing who that god is and what he's capable to do. So by the time when the story of Moses' first encounter with Yahweh was written, it didn't even matter whence the name originated. There we go. Nor its historical meaning. What mattered was the meaning it had for these readers, the Israelites, or maybe even the early Jews. In other words, while the name Yahweh didn't originate in Hebrew, it's provided a Hebrew meaning which communicates what they thought, what they sought most to emphasize about him. The Yahweh of Israel's history is not the same as the Yahweh of Israel's more developed and later religious expressions, which is what I'll talk a little bit about now. There's this long period of evolution and thinking about Yahweh for Israel, and we'd be remiss if we did not also explore the overarching theological essence of Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew Bible. In her book, Ancient Israelite Religion, Susan Neidich provided a crucial link between the importance of experience 
in the Israelite conception of God to the story of Moses in Exodus 3. She says this, Yahweh strongly identifies himself as Israel's rescuer. He knows of the Israelites' misery and suffering and identifies with their workaday experiences as oppressed slaves. This is comforting. It's an uplifting message of the experiential. Outside of historical perspectives or the social dimension of Israelite religion, there is a recurring salient point made about the significance of the name Yahweh in the biblical text. As far as Yahweh is concerned, his name is deemed so consequential, almost magical, that it prompted restrictions on its usage. I am Yahweh, he says, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slaves. There shall be no other gods for you but me. You shall not take up the name Yahweh your God unnecessarily, for Yahweh will not leave anyone unpunished who takes up his name without reason. That's Exodus 20, 2 to 3 and verse 7. So to answer this question, we turn over a few chapters from Exodus 3 to Exodus 5 and 6. After much protest and avoidance, Moses, with his loquacious brother Aaron in tow, goes to Egypt and delivers Yahweh's demand for the release of the sons of Israel to Pharaoh. Let my people go, he says, so that they may celebrate my feast in the wilderness. But Pharaoh is incredulous. To what end, Moses and Aaron, will you distract the people from their tasks? Get back to your work. This is a disaster. The Pharaoh then stops providing straw to the slaves and made their work of brick making more time consuming and difficult, all while refusing to reduce their quotas. Of course, the sons of Israel blame Moses. That Yahweh would look on you and judge fairly since you have made us stink in the eyes of Pharaoh, they say, and his underlings, putting a sword into their hand to kill us. So, Moses returns to Yahweh, and he says, Yahweh, why did you bring harm on this people? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has dealt worse with his people, and you have not delivered your people at all. This is a completely justifiable objection. Moses, in frustration, is calling for Yahweh to provide some rationale, a purpose, or an objective. What? is the point of this charade. The Mennonite biblical scholar, Elmer A. Martins, has keyed on this exchange between Moses and Yahweh as a linchpin to understanding the name of God, who he really is, and I think he's really onto something here. He says, a hesitation and uncertainty underlies his question. In colloquial language, one might phrase that question, God, what are you up to? The whole enterprise of the anticipated deliverance is called into question. Moses has just entered into his assignment. He thought he knew what was involved, but now that opposition has set in more vehemently. He steps back and in measured cadence asks the elementary but entirely basic question about his message. Why did you ever send me? Now, I might quibble with the degree of Moses' measured cadence, but... The point is that he is directing responsibility for what has happened to Yahweh. You have done nothing to deliver your people, he says in verse 21, 23. Then Yahweh said to Moses, you shall soon see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. A deliberate connection is made between Moses's accusatory question and Yahweh's capacity to act. You have done nothing, he says. Oh, so you shall soon see. If a God's name is inextricably tied to their function, then how does this now inform us about who Yahweh is? What does this say about Yahweh's existence? God spoke to Moses and said to him, in chapter 6, verse 2, I am Yahweh. When Yahweh speaks, he invokes his own name. He does so here and then three more times in response to Moses. I am Yahweh. Yahweh's name is the fulfillment. 
of mm -hmm. Moses's expectations and the outcome of his own divine activity. But why? Yahweh continues. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. But by that name, by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as nomads. So now I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel for myself, those whom Egypt has enslaved. I have remembered my covenant. Say to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I will rip you out of their enslavement. I will reclaim you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you for myself, my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, the one who has brought you out from, uh, from under the burdens of Egypt. I will bring you into the land of which I raised my hand and vowed to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you, a possession. I am Yahweh. So, what is Yahweh's job? What is his purpose? I'm going to leave you with two things. First, Yahweh is the present God. In Exodus 3.12, he declares to Moses, I will be with you. That is the sign for you that it was I who has sent you. The sign of Yahweh's power is his presence, but more than for just the here and now. The recollection of ancient promises is also invoked as a present resolution to uh, the ambiguity of God's identity in the past. In chapter 6, verse 3, Yahweh calls himself El Shaddai. El was the name of the great God of Canaan, and Shaddai is the singular intensified form of Shadim the mysterious malevolent or protective spirits from Deuteronomy 32.17. Translators commonly render this as God Almighty, and it is the appellation by which the ancient patriarchs knew El in the folk tales in Genesis. Genesis 49 verses 28 to 29 says, By the hand of the bull of Jacob, there the shepherd stoned of Israel, El, your father who helps you, and Shaddai. On the face of it, this seems like it could be a fairly generic designation of a now long forgotten God of the distant past. The self-identification of Yahweh with this ancient God now signals the beginning of the fulfillment of these long neglected promises, which he forgot. Distant memories now resuscitated by his name. Finally, he's here. Second, Yahweh is the saving God. In verse 6, he invokes explicit, excuse me, <coughs> he invokes explicit self-pronouncements of deliverance. I will bring you out. I will rip you out of enslavement. I will reclaim or redeem you. Within ancient Israelite culture, there is a social obligation among even distant relations of one's family. A man who is constrained to buy out the property of his kinsmen in the event of forfeit or crisis, to keep the family property within the holdings of the family. The reason for this was detailed in Leviticus 25, where Yahweh claimed that the land was his, and which he benevolently distributed it to his people, his inheritance, Israel. He says, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, because the land is mine. For you are tenants and sojourners with me. In all the land of your heritage, you shall provide for redemption of the land. That's verses 23 to 24. The picture of this is painted quite vividly in the book of Ruth. Boaz is a wealthy landholder in the Judean village of Bethlehem, and he has been imposed upon to reclaim the property of his relative, Elimelech, who has died. Elimelech had two sons, and they had also tragically passed away, leaving behind Moabite wives. Elimelech's own widow, Naomi, is accompanied by one of her daughters-in-law, Ruth, and they are now destitute, but for the goodwill of Boaz, who is set to reclaim her property. He says this before the elders of the village. You are witnesses today that I have acquired all of all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Machalon's, those are his sons, from the hand of Naomi. Also Ruth, the Moabite woman, I have acquired. 
the wife of Mahlon, for myself, for a wife, to raise the name of the dead man as his inheritance. The name of the dead man will not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses today. So, and I end with this. God is making good on his obligation in this text. And he's also providing the assurance for a restored state of beings. For the readers of this text, the sons of Israel have been wrongfully enslaved and dispossessed by the Egyptians. Now Yahweh is restoring their life and their heritage. He is bringing things back to the way they were always meant to be through Yahweh's saving power by the inherent substance of his name. The land of Israel becomes this tangible symbol of life with Yahweh. They think of it as an ideal life, an abundant life, and a life wrought by the conqueror, Yahweh, the God of war. So, that's it. Hooray! Let's see here. It's oh. over! <laughs> Damn, but, oh, thank God, no. That was awesome. Thank you, Yahweh? No, maybe? Um, we've got a couple additional questions here. I'd love to ask you if you've got a couple minutes. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm sorry that took so long. <laughs> no, that was interesting. I was I was watching the whole time. That was actually really interesting. And every time I didn't think I had a question, you'd bring something up and I would be like, well, now here's a new question. Um, so before I hop into the, the official question, somebody brought something up that reminded me of the beginning. When you mentioned that um, you weren't quite sure why Moses didn't actually sing the song, somebody in the comments brought up something that I was taught in school or I guess in church, we were told that it's thought that Moses had a stutter or a speech oh, impediment. Have you ever heard that? No, I haven't. <laughs> because they <laughs> they said good. when we when I was taught, I don't know about the the other person who commented, but they said that because so many of the passages are from his brother speaking for him or other people mm -hmm. speaking on his behalf, that it's thought that maybe he had a severe speech impediment. And so wow. he would relay the message to someone ahead of time and then they would stand with him and relay the message to other people which i thought was interesting that's a good, and so that's that a would pretty good thought though <laughs> yeah like makes sense so, why i wouldn't sing it now let's let's qualify that um a lot of these things are are stitched together from various traditions right right, right. and um the song of moses and then the book of deuteronomy that developed around the song of moses is quite a different thing than lots of the stories about the exodus that also developed around moses and there's a whole other thing to get into there too um you know it, you'll you'll probably hear it that a, a lot of scholars today uh don't think that there ever was a moses right. um in the same sense they don't think that there ever was an exodus or at least if there was an exodus it was nothing like it's described in right. the hebrew bible and there's there's a couple of interesting features that we do see in some of the older texts uh in another one of my lectures i i do a whole talk on hosea chapter 12 which actually combines these these two really old different competing traditions of israelite origins one of which is the exodus tradition but in that tradition moses is this unnamed anonymous prophet he doesn't even have hmm. a name and then there's uh this is this is heavily disputed but there is one of these these inscriptions from the kintilat ajrud inscriptions that i mentioned um there is one uh, inscription on, I believe it's a, a, a plaster on a wall. Um, it's hugely fragmentary, but it looks like it possibly could also reflect something like this, like a an anonymous prophet or leader bringing his people mm. out of bondage. So um, that all that to say, um, there's, there's it's just there's no no historical evidence right for a moses figure or an exodus but there right. certainly is some traction in the authenticity of stuff behind the stories right interesting very interesting and i'd heard that about the exodus too where people were like we really we don't have any evidence of one and if there was one it was probably a lot less people than they described 
Um, Kyle asked, did the earliest Israelites in Canaan bring Yahweh with them? Oh, wait, I think we did this question earlier. Or adopt it uh, from others. Yeah. So this was, I mean, this was actually right in there in, in the uh, lecture. Yahweh was definitely yeah. brought in yeah. to Canaan by someone, uh, right. whether they were Israelites or, you know, became Israelites is that's a whole other uh, question that's in another lecture. <laughs> so we linked the lectures in the in the comments so go find them uh and then kyle also asked did the hebrews at this time conceptualize yahweh and gods generally as actually being able to be convinced to change their plans or to undertake new actions in response to requests oh, and devotion absolutely that was the whole point um as i said uh the gods were like giant people uh, spectacular people, more, they were bigger, they were more powerful, they were smarter, um, they could do things that people uh, were not capable of doing by their own physical limitations, but they also had the same kinds of personalities as people. And if you read your biblical text carefully and without the, without the veneer of you know, hundreds and thousands of years of, of Jewish and Christian theology, uh, you can see this in the text themselves. The gods, uh, I mean, in Genesis, in, in the in the flood story, um, the, the whole reason uh, God decides to destroy and wipe out mankind is because he has become disappointed. It says he repented literally that he made man. Um, yeah, I I was just uh, uh, so the it's interesting because the word there um, that's translated as as repented or relented that he made man in some of the other places where it's used in the Hebrew Bible. It's used of this very violent uh, reaction. There's a story in Genesis about um, the sons of Jacob who discover that uh, this scoundrel named Shechem has raped their daughter, their sister Dinah. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that on this. Has you know, assaulted a um, their their sister Dinah and. Uh, the text when it says that uh, they sought their revenge on him uses this word. They were so violently enraged by what happened to her. This is the feeling that God had. Interesting. Him to flood the earth. Yeah. And to me, that honestly makes so much more sense than this 2024 narrative we're often given of like a, a just and kind God with nothing but examples of violence to reflect upon in the Bible. Nope. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me. I would love to know how we got there, at what point we took that that major turn. And then wannabe scholar asks, you said in a reply that some of this info is in a book you're writing. Any idea when it will be out? I don't know why it was I... so hard for me to read just then. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping the spring. It's probably going to be a little bit later, though. Um, I'm about half finished. Um, but yeah, it just at this point, it just depends on how much time I can commit to uh, to writing these days. So um, yeah, look for it probably in the summer now. That's cool. That's very cool. And then he also asked, do you think there's any relation between Hebiru? Uh, the Hebiru, yeah. Hebiru. And and the Hebrews. Yeah. So um the Hebiru are a people group that is mentioned in uh, a collection of very important texts that we know of from the, the Bronze Age called the the um the Amarna letters these are letters that were written uh there's correspondences back and forth between the pharaohs in egypt and the uh the rulers in canaan at 
you know, at the time of supposedly the Exodus. This is one of the reasons why we know the Exodus didn't happen, because we've got all this correspondence back and forth between Canaan and Egypt, and nobody ever said, oh, hey, we noticed you lost your entire army in the sea. Right. So, yeah, why well, um, do have to so, dip like that? Yeah, yeah. So there is mention of uh, of this people group, uh, the Habiru, and um, they are... There seems to be likely some, you can hear it, it feels like there is a there is a phonetic relationship there between Habiru and Hebrew. Um, the Habiru in these, in these correspondences are described as not necessarily like a, a distinct um, uh, ethnic group possibly but it seems more like these this is a social distinction um and they're like mercenaries who basically oh. run around and uh and cause all sorts of problems for the rulers in Canaan and this actually um dovetails fairly nicely with one of the theories about Israelite origins which is that they were Canaanites who always lived in the land of Canaan um, but then at some point, um, became dissatisfied and disillusioned with urban life, basically, and moved themselves out into the Judean highlands, into the hills outside of these Canaanite cities. Um, there's, and, and this tracks actually very neatly with a lot of the theology that you read, especially in, in many of the earlier texts of the Hebrew Bible. Um, there's a there's an idea that, that's been developed uh, more recently uh, that the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are actually written uh, as a, a, a polemic or a reaction to the most, what was considered the most famous story of the ancient world, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which originated in Sumer. And then, you know, over the course of thousands of years, it, it came to Babylon and to Assyria, and we found it in, uh, in uh, Canaan. So one of the ideas is that these first 11 chapters of Genesis is like a reversal or or a polemic against the epic of Gilgamesh and one and the one of the overarching themes of the epic of Gilgamesh is civilization. Uh, the epic begins with Gilgamesh admiring the the great walls of his city Uruk, um, and then you know the the this grand narrative is is like the middle part but but the story ends the exact same way it begins uh gilgamesh goes on this this great search for eternal life and for purpose and for meaning and ends up coming back to the city of Uruk and discovering that no his you know um it's his greatness or or the the meaning of his own life is in his legacy which is this great city um and there's these themes of civilization and urbanization that are are, are very clear throughout the epic of gilgamesh um you see a reversal of this in particular in the first 11 chapters of genesis um the the man and the woman uh adam and eve uh are created and set in the garden of eden which is not a wilderness paradise it is an urban landscaped garden um they end up you know being kicked out leaving the garden uh their son Cain, <clears throat> who is also the first murderer is the first man to build a city um the uh the great cities of uh of the ancient world are all built by um uh, another uh, figure who an, another another um, antagonistic figure Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod. We see the story. Yeah, the story of the Tower of Babel is a story about a city that you know God basically needs to 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 get people out of. And right? finally, Abraham leaves the city of Ur and spends his life wandering through this this foreign land 
So this, as I say that to say, it, this all dovetails very nicely with the historical reality that these people maybe removed themselves from urban life to go and live in these highlands away from the cities. And that's kind of where it all started. You know, I, I'll say one more thing and then we can move on just because this is a topic that I get kind of worked up about. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine recently shared with me some, some, uh, some literature. Uh, and I, I learned this, um, just, just through, uh, he's an archeologist and, uh, uh, he works in, in Roman period, um, uh, uh, context. And he shared with me a bunch of literature where, uh, pork and, uh, pig breeding, Mm -hmm. became a feature of urban living because these are the only animals that you can keep in these small spaces and also, huh. you know, be able to have tons to eat. So one of the distinctions of the, the, these, these settlements that, that archeologists identify as explicitly Israelite is the absence of pig bones. Uh, and this is, a, oh. this is a religious feature as well, right? This yeah. is this is an invective that's that's very strong throughout the Torah, and then it's it's uh, it's something you start to see uh, observed uh, also uh, uh, quite quite fastidiously in the uh, in in the later Jewish period. But could it be that this is also part of this? anti-urban polemic we don't raise pigs anymore because that's what right. they do in those dirty canaanite cities right. and do you think that was part of why not eating pork became such a staple in christian belief supposedly even though they all eat pork every single one of them yeah so I, and actually i think that's um i mean i always i always grew in in our christian tradition we always we always grew up um with this uh this teaching from peter has a vision in in the book of acts where where all these unclean animals are brought down on a on a sheet and god tells him to kill and eat um so hooray we can we we can eat whatever we want so i don't know um you know i'm sure there are i'm sure there are uh christian traditions where this continued to be observed um, but the, the really interesting thing to be emphasized here are that these traditions will take on a life of their own. Right. And they'll, stories will develop around them. Right. And the traditions then become, you know, the, the outcome of the story when usually it's actually the other way around. We have to tell these stories as a way to explain this thing that we have always done, but we don't really understand yeah. why. Right. Yeah, we, we're just going to keep telling the story anyway. We're not gonna we're not gonna try and figure it out. We don't want to why why uh fix it if it's not broken. I believe they say we'll just mm -hmm. keep doing it. We'll just tell the story. But this was absolutely fascinating, Doctor Kip. And there are hey. several things you talked about that I could absolutely understand why they become offshoots and separate lessons on their own. There's just so much there, and I loved seeing in the comments so many people just really diving into the stuff that you were talking about and asking really great questions and having conversation amongst themselves. Some people were guessing answers before you revealed them. It's just, it's really interesting to see how such a heavy topic can be so conversational and entertaining and informative and also take place on someplace like YouTube live and people Yay. are just commenting back and forth. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us awesome. and your, your this wealth. This was very enjoyable. This was a lot of fun. Thank I you. really enjoyed it. There were once or twice I forgot that I wasn't watching a video. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I should probably say something. I should probably be like, oh, yes. <laughs> and because I was just I was entertained. I was look, I was reading what you were putting on the screen. I was listening. Oh, um, if you don't have these lessons on a podcast, you should. I'm biased, but I oh. think you should. So I, I'm going to say one more thing here. So this lecture, the, the whole course uh, was a course that I actually developed while I was teaching at a Christian, an evangelical Christian university. Um, Interesting. And it looks a little, it looks a little different now, but I think people would be pretty surprised yes. at how little it actually has changed from what I used to teach um, there. That's, so, you should lead with that. 
Although I like the I reveal at the end. I though. probably should, right? Yeah, because yeah. that's that's even wilder. Knowing that m- the majority of this was the same when you taught at evangelical universities. That's see, that's again like an, a, another layer to all of this. There's so many layers. Like such a, I, I'm amazed that you could do it all in the amount of time that you did. So kudos to you. Um, Thank you. Th- yeah, I had I mean, some practice. I was gonna say, like, so it's, it's kind of your I, entire thing. It's like your whole job. Yeah. Um, yeah. For anybody watching or listening we've posted links to uh dr kip's channel in the comments we also posted links to uh the platform where you can check out his classes look for them in there Uh, i believe it was called mvp courses you can find the link in the comments and then i'll probably go back and add it to the description thank you dr kip i really appreciate you and for anybody who's still on this stream we are going to hop in in a couple of minutes to why is the end of the world so popular which is a talk put together by a friend of mine who a former debate opponent, um, now, current friend. And uh, but first, we're going to roll some trailers and things like that before we get Wise World so popular. And then at 730, I'm going to join Objectively Dan on a separate stream. And we're going to talk about a brief history of atheism, a brief and incomplete, as he put it, uh, history of atheism. So, Dr. Kip, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sydney. And let's see if I can get this to work tonight. I think I can. (laughs) I think I can. Okay, here we go. And roll. What you believe is what you think God believes. And it's just utterly brilliant research. They manipulated manipulated your belief. and, And basically it was if you changed your mind on a subject, lo and behold, God changed his mind as well. Wow. And, and it's 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 a, just a fascinating study that shows yes. that what we think God thinks or believes is a projection of our thoughts and beliefs. That oh. is a fun intro. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay. That took me, I kid you not, that took me like five and a half hours. So I was going to guess much more than that. Like that's yeah. impressive work. Took, yeah. Well, well done. I think total, if I had to count like collecting all the clips yeah, and yeah. things like that, probably yeah. a lot more, but the actual putting everything putting together. together yeah very long time yes very long i time. believe that like that oh. was i know what goes into that kind of thing it's like well done <laughs> so you liked it you felt you felt honored by that you feel, oh feel like you feel like it's worth okay, dancing cool. i was up here dancing yeah. love yeah it. i just i wanted to make sure that you felt like like we're going hard for dr bird <laughs> like we're, we're throwing it down <laughs> I love it. sometimes it's just uh the, the way that they talk about the church up the street you know, literally all, all yeah. those guys and the way they're doing things, you don't want to be part of, the, you know, and every, every other church, except for ours is doing it wrong. And yes, it's yes, like, yes. You know. Yeah. I told Vince, it's, you're almost better off being an atheist than being the wrong kind of evangelical Christian. <laughs> <laughs> you're, right. you're almost more salvageable, not believing in God at all than being a Presbyterian <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or a Methodist. In my childhood, I grew up with a mother who, she was religious, then she wasn't. She was religious, then she wasn't. What we called backslidden, right? Mm. And then I'd go visit my dad, who was never religious. So I would be like 9, 10, 11. I'd go visit for Christmas, and I'd be taken to drug parties. Like I was all of, like, I grew up in the 70s. So I'd wow. see the adults doing hash and smoking pot and drunk. And just, so I was like, I thought everything and I was never tempted to do anything. I never smoked. I never did drugs. I never drank. Nothing. I didn't even start drinking wine until I was like 37 or 38 years old. Wow. I just That's never had the out. desire. I never had the desire. That's impressive. Not but me. yeah. And so my <laughs> mom's walk with the Lord was so wishy-washy. I just never saw a real strong commitment with anyone. Well, so that- that's why you're an atheist. Yeah, <laughs> so she's never had. That's what people never really knew God. <laughs>